Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Response. This is session 83 in our series uh, that began, as many of you know, in uh, March of, of uh, 2020. uh with the declaration of the pandemic and we were all going wtf i mean what is this what does it mean how how serious is it well we we just didn't know i mean we really didn't know i was just looking at uh some statistics some demographics uh in 2021 covid was the third leading cause of death in the u.s and it caused the the life expectancy to drop by nearly two years and it hasn't actually come back up all the way yet, about halfway back up. So it was serious. Uh, vaccines came along in 2021 and uh, later in 2021, and things began to relax as the virus morphed into less lethal, uh, less contagious. And then the degree of uh, immunization from uh, prior infections and vaccinations put a damper on it to the point where I guess that was last year in 2022 it was declared over that's debatable uh this is a, a live novel virus that's out there mutating every day and nothing technically can stop it from reasserting itself in another more contagious or and or lethal form so uh it's still with us uh Today, we're going to dive into uh, another type of a crisis, which is uh, the funding of the Universal Service Fund, which I know of you are uh, anxious to hear more about, and probably quite a few of you are very knowledgeable about, and we're looking forward to hearing from everyone about this. We want to make it more interactive uh, today, and, uh, and I think we will. Uh, our speakers are uh, Doug Dawson, who I think will join us, he hasn't shown up yet, and John Windhausen, who has shown up. Uh, both Doug and John are returning uh, speakers, and uh, we'll get to them in a moment. So we are the Gate Libraries Network. Uh, we started in 2007 as Fiber to the Library, a campaign to connect all 17,000 U.S. libraries with fiber as the most economical, expedient, and equitable way to deliver next generation broadband in every community. It seemed like a really straightforward idea. And so we're still working on that. Uh, and part of that uh, implementation, part of that strategy, advocacy strategy was helping co-found the Shelby Coalition, which John has led from the beginning. So so ably, it's, a, it's an amazing story how, how Shelby has evolved into a, uh, a force in uh, federal policy due to the fact that it is a kind of a meta association of associations that have come together to share their needs and concerns and ideas in such a way that where there's consensus around particular positions, those can be put forward to, to whomever, to Congress, to the FCC, to NTIA, as a consensus position on these various uh, communications issues. And that is a real boon. That's a, an incredible uh, time saver for all the staff, all, you know, congressional staff, SECs, everybody that otherwise has had to meet with each organization to hear their position, take notes on what their concerns are, then try to consolidate those into a position, offer it back and say, how does this sound? And we'll, yeah, this and this, but that, not that. So Shelby does all that in advance. It's a tremendous uh, uh, gain and has become a primary vehicle for communication into Washington and out of Washington. And anybody has a voice, it's a member of Shelby. And we're proud to have uh, been there uh, from the beginning. Our host and partner in uh, this series is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, uh, IFLA.org, based in The Hague, and at the controls is uh, Stephen Weiber, as ever, uh, the head of public policy for IFLA. We have, as in uh, partnership with IFLA, we've 
gone international. We're we're involved in projects uh, outside of the U.S. Uh, we think this <clears throat> connectivity challenge, the digital divide, so-called, is a global issue. And in the terms of the network effect, the more the better. And certainly it's a, a issue about equitable uh, access everywhere. And there's still nearly 3 billion people that are not participating in what many of us have been doing for the last 25 years. And it just seems like that's that grows less tenable all the time. Our sponsor uh, for the series now, and for, well, for a while yet anyway, is IMLS, our good old federal library agency, uh, Institute for Museum and Library Services, for which we are grateful. So uh, just to review that, uh, this is one of the IMLS reports on how uh, the pandemic uh, impacted the way uh, public libraries deliver their services, and we've had a number of issues, a number of sessions around that very topic, and have had testimonies, and uh, we've had a lot of presentations from straight libraries, one of our favorite groups, uh, because they connect with all the libraries basically and are a vehicle for best practices and policy and the rest of it. So uh, the the number of crises has expanded a bit since, since the pandemic to include these other interesting challenges we've got here. Climate, war, war now. Uh, we didn't think that was really a, a crisis, but no denying it these days. And then AI has come on the scene, which has been a very pop popular topic for us. We've done a number of sessions around that and we'll do more. And this cartoon is one of my favorites here. It's just, uh, he longs for the days when uh, nuclear annihilation was the only thing he had to worry about. Well, you know, the good old days are gone. So USF uh, is uh, ranges from five to $8 billion a year program that, uh, uh, funds E-rate for schools and libraries, uh, the low income fund uh, for just what it says, uh, rural health care, uh, increasingly uh, uh, a dire circumstance as more and more facilities close in rural areas, shortage of doctors, shortage of everything. So the, the communication capability is an, a slight offset for that. And telemedicine is, is on the rise. Uh, the high cost fund is there for the same general population uh, that are least served in our rural areas. And so these are the four programs that uh, divide this budget. The challenge, of course, is the, uh, uh, the contribution factor. So this is the outlook, uh, and it's jumped dramatically. This money comes out of the, the bills to... Uh, uh, interstate and international telephone calls, which are on the decline. And the factor has risen up. That is to say the percentage charge against those declining number of uh, users uh, to offset the loss of income has risen to uh, over 30% and is headed towards 50% if nothing is done. And that just is unsustainable, as I think everybody agrees. So there are two principal uh, alternative um, sources that have not yet been tapped. One is broadband internet, access services, ISPs, and uh, so-called edge providers, the, all the companies that leverage this amazing network to make incredible amounts of money. So it's tempting just because they're the biggest companies in the world, but it's also, uh, pro well, everything's problematic and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So with that, uh, we will begin uh, with John, who's gonna take us out. John is the executive director of Shelby, longtime friend and ally and, and a real leader in this space. Uh, Doug runs the, Pots and Pans, which is a daily newsletter. It's amazing that he can put out so much insightful information every single day. Uh, and, and I hope he's going to make it today. 
So with that, I will stop sharing and I will turn it over to John. And welcome you, John. Welcome you back right. to Libraries and Response. So please, uh, why don't you lay this all out for us? All right. Well, thank you very much, Don. It's very uh, nice of you to say those positive things about Shelby uh, and our growth. And of course, you have had a lot to do with that. The fact that we are in the position where we're in today because you were the founding chairman of the board of the Shelby Coalition when we first um, incorporated back in 2012. And under your leadership, we I, I think we uh, something like doubled our membership during your term from roughly 30 members to like 60 members, which we were hooting and hollering about back then in 2012. And now we have over 300 members. Uh, wow. And so we've seen, you know, quite significant growth and uh, we are and just adopted a new strategic plan where our next target is to get to 600 members in the next couple of Great. years. So we have big ambitions. We've been having an influence and we're very proud of that. Uh, but we could have even more. And there's so much going on in this field, so many issues uh, where we are determined to play a role and advance the interests of anchor institutions and all and, and just people everywhere. Because uh, ultimately, the Shelby Coalition wants everybody to have affordable high speed Internet access. So um, I've prepared a few comments here, which I'd like to run through to kind of set the stage for the Universal Service Fund connectivity. Uh, and then I hope Doug joins, but if not, you and I will have a conversation and along with the, the members who have signed in here. So look forward to this conversation. So I thought I'd start with a little bit of an anecdote. You know, I, I think a lot of people know that the term universal service was first coined by Theodore Vail, who was the CEO of AT&T back in like 1907. Um, and that term persists today as a key uh, component of our 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 telecom telecommunications and broadband policy, but actually when Theodore Vail coined the term universal service, he meant it in uh, something very different, because at that time in the early 1900s, uh, there was a lot of more competition among telephone providers, and about 45 to 50 percent of cities in the country had two or more competing telephone networks. And so about half of the country in the urban areas had to have two telephones, one for each telephone network, that they were not interconnected. And so in other words, they had dual service. So AT&T didn't like that. They wanted to have a single service provider to justify their monopoly. But if they called it single service, that would too, look too monopolistic. So instead, they coined the term universal service as a way <laughs> to justify their efforts to take over the telecom market. So of course now universal service means something different. And you know, even back then uh, the FCC, or I'm sorry, Congress um, incorporated the concept of universal service, meaning ubiquitous and affordable communications for all. And that was enshrined in kind of one of the Communications Act of 1934. Um, and uh, for decades, the concept of universal service that was really handled internally within the AT&T and, and Bell system. So in other words, long distance rates were kept high, uh, high higher than their costs. And the long distance providers like AT&T provided a subsidy to the local operating companies, which they also largely owned and controlled through the Bell system. Uh, but they subsidized local service to keep those costs low to consumers to encourage greater subscribership to telephone service. And that policy led to 92% of households having telephone service by the early 1980s. And that was at the time regarded as a success of that program. Well, those internal subsidies, of course, work well in a more monopolistic environment, but not so well when you have multiple providers. So when the uh, uh, MCI and Sprint came along to challenge the at and monopoly uh, in long distance service, um, the whole universal service internal subsidy system began to uh, collapse because AT&T was paying that subsidy, but MCI and Sprint were not. So we needed a new system. And the Telecommunications Act uh, also advanced the cause of trying to introduce more competition into 
not just the long distance, but also the local marketplace. But we needed a new system to continue the universal service uh, concept and principles. So Congress added a new section 254 to the Communications Act that provided guidance to the FCC on how to collect the funding and distribute the funding. So the FCC has already had the Lifeline program going and the high cost program going before the 1996 Act. The 96 Act kind of ratified those two programs, but also added the E-rate program and the rural healthcare program, as you noted in your uh, opening comments. But in terms of the funding mechanism, uh, this is where it gets really interesting in the topic of this webinar is how to fund that universal service fund. So the act created the universal service fund and it uh, said that all providers of telecommunications service shall contribute into the universal service fund. So it wasn't just AT&T or any single provider, it was all telecommunications services providers. Then in addition, the act also gave the FCC permissive authority to require any provider of telecommunications to also contribute into the universal service fund. So in a you know wordplay, uh, there's a difference between telecommunications service, which is required to contribute, and providers of telecommunications, where the FCC has permissive authority to assess them. And for instance, the FCC used that permissive authority to require VoIP providers to contribute into the fund about uh, a decade ago. But obviously the economics of the universal service contribution system have changed a lot since 1996. Broadband is replacing telecommunications as the primary service uh, you know, used by consumers. Um, as a result, the total telecommunications revenues has shrunk from about 80 billion to less than $30 billion today. And it's projected to drop even further to 25 billion in the next few years. So that's caused the universal service contribution factor to go up to now 34.5%. And that's projected to grow even higher because of the, the drop in telecom revenues, as I said. Now, also want to be clear, the increase in the contribution factor is not because of growth in the pot of money that's being spent. The universal service fund uh, disbursements were uh, in 2012, were about 8.7 billion. And today it's about $9 billion uh, over a decade later. So no appreciable growth, some slight growth, but that's not the reason why the contribution factor keeps going up and up. It's because of the, the declining base of telecom revenues. So that's the problem. And I think there's a widespread agreement that the current system is not sustainable. Um, I, I think everybody on both sides of the aisle recognizes that the current system is not gonna be able to continue in place and, and it's in danger of collapse. And all these four of these essential programs uh, could disappear unless we store up the funding mechanism. Um, and of course, the more that the universal service fund fee increases, the greater the incentive to avoid it. So as a result, now some consumers are paying a USF fee today, but others are not, even though they're using similar services, substitutable services. So the current system is not only leading to higher and higher uh, fees, but it's also increasingly discriminatory and regressive. So the people who are still relying on plain old telephone services are paying a fee, but the broadband only consumers are not paying anything. And that's unfair and hurts poor people the most. So that's why Shelby has proposed uh, a different mechanism. Uh, we believe that the best solution is to expand the base of revenues to assessing to include broadband internet access service. As you pointed out in your earlier slide, broadband internet access service or BIAS. So we hired Carol Maddy a couple of years ago along with Encompass and NTCA, uh, but it was kind of my idea, if you will, to hire Carol, she's a renowned USF expert, to study the problem. And she issued the report that found that expanding the base to include bias revenues would lower the contribution fee uh, from over 30% where it is today to less than 4% going forward. And she also found that that was a, the most reasonable solution because providing that source of funding from bias service is more stable. Uh, it, it's going to lead to a more stable contribution mechanism for years and years to come because broadband revenues keep increasing. Uh, it's also more measurable and definable. You know, broadband internet access service is a defined term 
And in fact, the, the ISPs that provide broadband service, they report those revenues uh, to the IRS. And so it is a defined term that has some meaning and I'll come back to why that's important. And it's also non-discriminatory, it's more fair. All, everybody who's using broadband services will pay. And after a while, the money in the Universal Service Fund is used primarily to fund broadband services. So it makes logical sense for broadband services to come into the fund uh, if they're the beneficiaries as well. Now, I know there's another set of uh, opinions out there that would try to assess edge providers or suggesting that we assess edge providers or platform providers. Shelby has not decided officially yay or nay on that idea, but there are some practical problems that we see with that approach. I guess, first off, it's, it's a concept. It's not really a plan. One of the FCC commissioners, just as an example, uh, an FCC uh, commissioner said, legislators could consider a range of possible revenue streams from platform providers, including video streaming, online advertising, app stores and devices, content delivery networks and cloud services and online gaming services. So these are a lot of different options, uh, but how do you define and enforce them? How do you articulate who is paying into the fund, who is one of these services, who is not, because they are so, uh, you know, the boundary lines between these different services are not clear. You know, would a, a library, for instance, that posts information on their website, are they a, a, an edge provider, a platform provider, or a school system for that matter? So there are all kinds of different ways that you could enforce that, uh, that would lead to widespread um, efforts to try to evade the fee. And then in addition, there's the other really significant problem that the FCC does not have the authority under the statute to assess these edge providers today. So you'd have to go to Congress to give and ask the Congress to give the FCC that authority. Um, and of course, relying on Congress to do anything of the sort uh, is very doubtful. So meanwhile, the contribution <laughs> factor will keep going up and up and the whole system could collapse before Congress decides what to do. So interesting, um, John. That's why. Doug, by the way, has joined yeah. us. I see that. Yes, <clears throat> and I'll just have uh, one more second to wrap up, and then I'll be glad to turn things over to Doug. Um, so I would just say that the FCC does have the authority to assess bias service today, under that permissive language that's already in Section Two Fifty Four in the statute. So. You don't have to go back to Congress for the FCC to make this change to assess broadband service and put them into the pot. Unfortunately, the FCC to date has not been willing to tackle this problem. The FCC has not made a decision itself about how to do. And I know, Don, the article that you quoted in the lead up to the story indicated that the FCC is inclined to support the, the edge providers idea. But I don't think that's uh, I don't think that reporter got it quite right. Because uh, the FCC, in that report to Congress last year, discussed the Shelby position of assessing bias. It also discussed the edge providers. It also discussed the third idea of uh, that AT and T is supporting of uh, going to Congress for annual appropriations. But the FCC never decided which of those three mechanisms was the best. It basically kicked it back to Congress for a decision. So that's the dilemma that we're in now. Um, you know, it's a hot button issue for some people, and that's why it's tricky politically, but yet, yet it needs to be solved. Otherwise, these essential universal service programs are in, are in big jeopardy of, of collapsing. So I'm happy to talk about this some more. Welcome Doug's comments and look forward to the questions. That's, that's why we're here to talk about it more. Uh, essential is the right word, John. I mean, many tens of millions of people totally rely on these programs, absolutely rely on them and hence the country itself relies on it. So it's certainly non-trivial. Uh, it's a question, just before I hand it back to Doug, is why have, have the requests not risen? It seems like it would be a natural order of things as broadband expands. And of course, the first point being broadband as, dis, as not distinguishes telecommunications, which is of course ridiculous, but that's the way we've declared things. But why hasn't it grown? Why hasn't the demand grown for USF requests. John. John? Oh, I'm sorry, John. I thought that was a question you were bringing Doug in. What was the question again? 
I'm, I'm offered to both of you, but I want you to respond first, if you would, and then we'll introduce Doug. So what, your question is, why hasn't the, the need grown in Congress for a solution? Right. No, no, the, the fund itself, you said, has held pretty steadily. It hasn't really gone up or down much. Why not? Why It seems like expanding broadband would cause it to rise. The need, the request. Um, yes, well, I mean, you could look at each of the four components of the fund. So for instance, in the E-rate program, we actually, the FCC with Selby's support reformed the E-rate program in 2014 to allow schools and libraries to use E-rate to get more funding for fiber. And you know, some of the opponents at the time said, oh no, that's gonna blow up the fund. And in fact, we we said the opposite, that you know, getting fiber to the libraries and the schools would be a more cost-effective way of using that money. And we were right, because as a result of those reforms, the E-rate total dollars for E-rate have gone down uh, in the last decade. So that's an example of more efficient use of those dollars. Um, so it's not because there's a lack of desire, it, it, just the opposite. These more, you know, the more you can invest in these newer uh, technologies, the more cost effective they are. Very good. We'll use that as a placeholder. Uh, so welcome, Doug. Let me, yeah, let me get you up here. Uh, Doug is returning. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, he helped us illuminate, uh, actually, uh, both John and Doug were here a few months back, I think now, uh, uh, exploring the bead program, which is related to what we're talking about today. These are funding sources for for connectivity for uh, the country. And that was a, a great session. Like all our sessions, it's recorded and, and archived at giglibraries.net. Doug, I was just uh, bragging on you that uh, you are uh, a brilliant observer of this phenomena and relentless in your ability to uh, hold forth every day on topics of of, uh, of interest. So it's great to have you back and and to talk about this essential uh, service that the USF uh, provides, services, I guess we could say. So welcome back and tell us how you see all this. Well, I'm going to bounce around a bit because John made some interesting points. I'll try to respond to various points he made here. Uh, first on the last issue, to be honest, the reason that there's not been more demand to push it to the ISPs is quite honestly because of their lobbying power. I mean, for the last several FCC makeups of the commissioners, they've been very anti pushing things to broadband providers. So that's just been a historic trend that those guys work really hard to never get any new obligations. On top of that, we have this very bizarre 25 year old, or now it's about 22 year old uh, phenomenon where we decided way back when that we weren't going to tax the internet. I don't know if you remember that, but when it first came out, everybody wanted to throw taxes at it like you do everything else. And Congress had specifically made a ruling not to do that. And, um, and so, and that was supposed to be temporary. This brand new industry was supposed to spring forward. Well, these the big ISPs still keep bringing that up. Like, guys, you're one of the biggest industries in the country. <laughs> you know, we're, we should be able to tax you now. I mean, you know, you know you're, you're essential to every other industry. You make a huge amount of money. So, but that's still part of their argument is we don't tax the internet. So, you know, it's crazy as that sounds, that's actually something that they say all the time. Um, I want to come out and make a point that John made. You know, the current method is actually already broken because it's not, it's not easy like going to see what your tax revenues are at the IRS. You have to go through a complicated formula. USF is only allocated on the interstate portion of telephone service. And everyone who pays into it tries very hard to get that number as small as possible because it's not very easily defined. And so uh, they have these crazy formulas to determine how much of your home telephone bill or how much of the connection made to a school or whatever they're selling is interstate in nature. Uh, and that's very arbitrary. And so the current the current method of even allocating it is not a number that you can easily audit. And so and so every single company that works to turn in their fees has their own interpretation of even what 
what should be taxable. I mean, it's a very weirdly broken system. Um, you know, so, and because of that, we have little ISPs who are paying three times more than they should, other ones who are paying half what they should. So the rules are not even consistent among the people who pay into the fund. Um, you know, the most interesting argument that the ISPs make is they don't think they should have to pick up the bill for this, the broadband providers, but they're not going to. They're going to pass it on to people's bills as a 25 cent surcharge. Because when, and now when John starts talking a 4% fee, that's not gigantic. It's not like the 30% fee. Those 30% fees are really being passed on to people. So you're seeing them on their actual bill. It's getting bigger and bigger every year. But, you know, that's a tiny fee. We have fees for everything else in this industry. We have a fee for paying for the 911 system. We have a fee for paying for hard of hearing folks to get special sets. I mean, why not have a fee to pay on broadband to support broadband, right? And so the argument that they <clears throat> that ISP shouldn't bear the burden is a bad argument because they're not going to bear the burden. They're not one of them is going to swallow these fees. They're going to turn right around and pass them on to customers. And it doesn't even put them at a competitive disadvantage because the people they're competing against will also have the fee. You know, in every city, all the ISPs will have the fee. And so broadband just went up three or 4% in cost. Uh, is that going to break the bank anywhere? I don't think so. Um, and, and if you have a low income $30 connection, your, your USF fee is way smaller than someone who buys the $150 version. And that's fair too, right? So, so you know, I think that the argument that we can't, that they shouldn't pay it, it simply doesn't bear any, doesn't bear any common sense at all. You already said it, Don. This fund has has nothing to do with telecom anymore. It has everything to do with broadband. Why isn't broadband revenue supporting the fund? It's almost that fundamental. Um, the idea of, of doing, going to the edge connectors is beyond complicated because, uh, and I think that the child said this, where do you stop defining somebody as an edge provider? I mean, you know, do we, uh, do we attach this fee to a high school group who puts their yearbook stuff online? I mean, where do you run out of, where do you stop saying this is the line where we don't start charging this assessment to folks? Because it's, you know, everybody that has a website could potentially could be sucked into this. I and mean, it's, it's crazy. And, you know, is your website actually hosted overseas? I mean, you can start listing 150 questions about how this can't work, right? Congress will never figure this out because they would have to come up. Taxing formulas are very specific. They go, you know, your property taxes, here's how we do it. Here's the millage. Here's how we assess your house. I just can't even picture for this very amazingly complex ecosystem that we have for broadband edge providers, how they could decide. I mean, what they mean when they say that is they mean, they believe that means Netflix, Google, you know, three or four biggest players. And they're all going to say, why just me? And that's where we get into trouble. Now, Congress could do that. They could come and say it's Microsoft, you know, you know, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. They're probably not going to do that because that probably doesn't hold up to a court challenge. I can't imagine they're ever going to get there on that concept. Um, you know, interestingly, um, everything nowadays in Congress comes down to lobbying. In the old days, AT&T and Comcast and Charter spoke for the whole industry on Capitol Hill. They don't anymore. Those other big companies actually have as many or more lobbyists there than the, than the ISPs do. So, I mean, so, you know, there, there's going to be lots of lobbying from Google and Facebook and Netflix and everyone not to give them these fees. And that's, and that's, we all know that's how laws are decided anymore at the congressional level, which means they're never going to get it to solve. Um, <clears throat> I think we might finally have an FCC that's willing to strongly consider it because it is broken. There's things they want to do. I mean, they want to put out a, a $9 billion fund this year to start building rural cell sites, which are very badly needed. Anyone who lives in a rural area can tell you their cell coverage is just horrible. I mean, I live in a city, but I can drive two miles away and there's no cell phone coverage. I can drive two hours north and for the whole period, there's no cell phone coverage. I mean, it's bad, right? Um, and so, and, and the FCC says $9 billion is not nearly enough money to fix it. And 
And that answers another question you would ask John. The reason the fund doesn't grow is the FCC has to stick within the budget. They only take on projects of, of which they're gathering this USF revenue for. They're not about to put so many things in there that that's going to turn into a 100% assessment. I mean, you know, they're already very panicky over the 30%. So um, they would definitely do more if they had more money. Um, so, you know, and that's one. I mean, we could easily spend, you know, $80, $80 million to get to get rural cell phone towers. And once you got them, we got them, right? So, um, so you know, that's certainly a need. Is and Nowadays, that's broadband. It, five years ago, that wasn't broadband. Now it is broadband. I just did a, 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 a study for a rural county in Missouri. 15% of all the people in that county now are using cellular broadband. It's really changed. I mean, it, you wouldn't have, you found hardly anybody doing that a few years ago. So we, we kind of forget that that's out there. And the reason that, that people are using it has gotten a lot faster. So now instead of being three megabits, it's 50 or 100 megabits and everyone's jumping on it. So that's broadband too. And so those folks should be paying in here just like everybody else. But we got if, but if we want those folks to have that kind of broadband, we got to build them cell towers. So, uh, so, th so yeah, your list of the things that this fund does are magnificent. I mean, it's, it was one of the best concepts that they ever came up with at the FCC. It's, it's one of the, th this is where my bias comes in. It's one of the few things they haven't screwed up. <laughs> uh, I mean, they've made a lot of really weird decisions over the years, but this fund really does real good and it does real good every day. And, and, and uh, you know, we, ju we just went through, you know, the, the FCC changes as we get new presidents. And the last, the last FCC set of commissioners were very pro large ISPs. I mean, it was very clear they were never going to do this. The danger we get into, and this scares me, in that I'm afraid, I'm afraid of a regime where every time we change administration, they change these rules on us. Because they did that with net neutrality. Under one under the Obama administration, they put the rules in. Under the next administration, they took it out, and now they're going to put it back in. I would hate to see them trying to do that with who gets to pay into the USF. And it's not beyond the pale anymore. The politics will play that role in this. So, <clears throat> I mean, Congress really needs to be the one to fix it because then it would be a law, and it wouldn't be a matter of which three people become FCC commissioners, right? So, so you know. We can fix it, but how do we, you know, I'm, I'm more worried about how do we permanently fix it and not have to worry about politics ever raising its ugly head in here again. So, um, and maybe I'm very naive in that. You would think by my age, I would stop being naive. <laughs> um, so yeah, so yeah, so everything that John said, I completely agree with. It's completely broken. It's gonna get more broken. And if we don't fix it soon, you know, it's very likely you wake up one day and they're going to go, I'm sorry, we only have 80% of the money for, for schools and libraries this year for E-rate. And everybody's going to panic. And so, and it's going to go right down the line, right? So that, that day could very easily be coming. Um, I think I, I think the estimate of the revenues to feed it could actually be worse than John suggested. I mean, telephone service could disappear very quickly. Um, because a lot of the folks paying into it are rural. Those folks still have their landlines, and as they start getting these grants out in those areas, they're going to drop those landlines. That's where the majority of landlines are. A lot of them nowadays are, are people who don't have a choice. They still have a landline because if they didn't, and their cell coverage is bad, if they don't have one, they can't talk to anybody. Uh, but as we start fixing the rural broadband, I think we're going to see another giant drop in, in, in telephone penetration. And so that just makes it all that much harder to make this thing work. So, um, yeah, so um, uh, you're not going to, unfortunately, if you wanted John and I to be disagreeing with each other, you're not going to get that today. <laughs> I think we, I think we both see it exactly the same way. Um, what we don't know is we don't know how the heck we talk these folks into fixing it. I mean, that's the million dollar question, right? So. Well, maybe we'll, Maybe we'll find something you you two can. Well, we, uh, we certainly about. know. Well, you we might, but we certainly, your organization and many others can start planting the seed of how important it is to get this fixed. That's how you've gotten things done in the past. I mean, this needs to become a priority. We don't want to wait till it's broken because then it'll take two years to fix it, right? So, 
Right. So I, well, you, know. you, you touched on a lot of sensitivities, Doug, and, and kind of yeah. delicate boundaries on, on the program. Uh, you're one about uh, the continuity. The entire federal government suffers the same exact phenomenon. You could have massive programs and suddenly they're just, you know, canceled. You've got a whole structure set up to service and deploy and fund it. And then suddenly it's gone. And, you know, all that uh, planning, it's it's a mess that we 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 lack that kind of I don't know if we've ever had it, but it, we we certainly have it less today than, than ever before. Um, the the idea that the carriers are squeezing out the portion that they want to apply the uh, the, uh, the fund tax to seems to be contrary because that would simply increase the pressure to reform it. And they're the most likely candidates to be affected as the ISPs. I, I don't know, but you well, know, well, maybe let me, answer that. let me answer that at a different question. Here's what's so bizarre about them not liking this. Where does the money go in school libraries? It goes to ISPs. Mm -hmm. It turns right around and goes into their pocket. It's like, guys, don't you like this? I mean, you're there. Nope, it all goes to them, or at least ninety-eight percent of it. I mean, there are some communities that are their own ISP for this, but I mean, it almost all turns right around and goes back to them. And and so, why would they not be willing to just support this? Because if they supported this, there could be more money for schools and libraries so that more schools got assistance and they would get more money back out of the fund itself. But they, they don't think that way. They, they simply have no. their, their mentality ever since broadband started was we don't want to be regulated. And to them, anything they get, once this fee gets on there, they go, it's going to be there forever. And we all go, yes, it will be there forever. We want it to be there forever. <laughs> right? But But they don't pay it. Their customers pay it, they benefit from it, but that's logic and there's no logic involved in this. This is, ISPs, believe it or not, being regulated for them is not a logical or a business decision. It's actually, it's hard to think of this, but it's an emotional decision. You don't think of giant corporations having one, but they have such an antipathy against being regulated that it's almost, it's almost genetic. <laughs> I mean, they're they're like we just don't want to be regulated, and this would be to them. This feels like another kind of regulation, right? Uh, and I think so you've answered that, the question. Yeah, unfortunately, that's you know, and, and that's why somebody just has to say, "Well, we've heard you. Here's the new tax, right? Here's the new fee." So uh, we did. We need an okay. FCC with backbone. Yeah, we need a Congress that's coherent. Oh uh, uh, yeah. Well, so yeah, we, we're not uh, solving that today. <laughs> not today. <laughs> <laughs> what what uh what uh has Doug left out or got wrong or well I mean I, I agree with Doug that we're mostly in agreement. I did find one thing that I can quibble with, uh just for the sake of conversation. I think it's a little overly simplistic to talk about the ISPs as a whole opposing yes, contribution reform. Um there are some telecom service providers that are broadband internet service providers as well that actually are willing to um, engage in the uh, uh, debate about, um, well, I'm not saying that the right way, they're willing to support assessing um, broadband internet access service. So for instance, I mentioned that joint report that Shelby commissioned Carol Maddie to write, and we joined with Encompass and NTCA, the National Telecommunications Cooperative Association, and they're you know, they've got several hundred um, members, telephone co-ops that are members of that organization. And they like the idea of assessing broadband service because they're providing both telephone service and broadband service. So if they have to charge a fee on the broadband service, uh, they may not love that, but their, their telephone fee would go down accordingly. So I think they're more willing to engage and support uh, this kind of solution. Um, I think the cable companies, uh, those ISPs are probably least likely to support the idea of assessing bias because they don't have as much telephone revenues. So they're not paying much at all right now and they would have to pay more under this system. So I think that's more of the division of the 
politics. It influences the politics a little bit. But but I also agree with what Doug said. Even the cable companies got a lot of money out of the Universal Service Fund. So it's a little in apposite for them to not pay into the fund, but also benefit from the fund. So it kind of makes uh, some sense that even the cable companies, to the extent they're providing broadband service, they ought to pay into the fund too. That would be only fair. And, good, and I good point. Agree, uh, and I agree with that because when I said ISPs, I'm talking about like the biggest ten. I mean, the, it's the big guys who are against this. Little guys see the sense in it because they want this fund to continue. I mean, right. they all so benefit. Let's complete. Sorry. Yes. Let's complete this picture. Who are we talking about? We're talking about small rural uh, providers. We're talking about the cable companies, of course, the phone companies. Are we talking about nonprofits? Are we talking about uh, community networks? Who's in and who's out in this provider category? Today, the people paying in are mostly regulated telephone companies because the other kind of telephone companies have wiggled their way out of it by declaring what they do is not really telephone service. Some of them pay, but they've done a pretty good job of declaring themselves. Like cable companies sell a ton of telephone service, but they don't call it telephone service. So they call it voice over IP and then the states they're in and it doesn't count. And so, you know, they've been very good at, uh, you know, and again, the FCC let them do that. They could have just said telephone services, telephone service for USF purposes, but they didn't. So, uh, so, so it's really the the folks that are still selling plain old telephones on your desk. But the bulk of it actually right. comes no, from. Excuse the me, Doug, the I'm money, talking about the fix. Who, oh, the who fix. will be paying to it? Yes, right. Well, every, and well, can you bring up a good point about well, even, the well, even there, that's a good question. Services. Well, that's a very good question because. You know who is an ISP? If because there's a lot of school systems who buy bulk broadband and then distribute it to their schools, and and for all practical purposes, they're an ISP. You know, so so the you know would they have to pay into this? Um, and that's a question that we are we fight about all the time. Not fight about, but we debate about because those folks go because if I have to do that, am I also I'm also subject to these other six rules, and and a lot of them are always in limbo about whether they should be doing these other mm -hmm. things that ISPs have to do. Like a lot of them do not report those schools to the FCC mapping because they go, "Well, I'm not really an ISP." And it's like, "Yeah, you really are," and we and you kind of want to get them listed in the map so that everybody can see that they have gigabit broadband. But but you know, so the answer is. If the FCC says you're an ISP, you would pay in, and that doesn't matter what your status is. Um, but there are a lot of these semi ISPs, which are mostly schools, cities. Uh, there's large corporations who do their own broadband. It's like, you know, are, are they ISPs? I I don't know. I mean, years ago, Ford Motor Company put together a private network all across all their factories in Michigan and did all their own stuff. They were their own ISP for all practical purposes. They didn't buy it. You know, they went and bought it from the same people that everyone else buys it from wholesale. Um, but, but they uh, never got pulled network, into the ISP. They never got pulled considered. into the ISP thing. Yeah. 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 John, how did how did the, the shell position deal with this? You might say tail end of the of the definition of ISPs. Well, Thanks, Don. Let me clarify a little bit more how our, our position would work, because our proposal is to assess providers of broadband internet access service. So that is a specifically defined term that refers to mass market provision of broadband internet access service to consumers. So, for instance, mm -hmm. private networks that are just that are not offering mass market service. They're just private networks connecting individual units of like a you know, multi-campus uh, uh, university or a Ford network that's just connecting their various offices or, or insurance companies. Those would not pay because they're not providing bias service. So it's providing bias service to the public that would pay. Whether you're a nonprofit or for-profit or, or a community-owned network, it doesn't matter who you are, it matters what service you're providing. Now, having said that, there are a couple of ways that the FCC has and, and probably could tailor that a little bit because right now there's a de minimis exception under the rules. So if you are a very small 
telecommunications provider. Uh, below, I think it's like, I forgot the number, $10,000 rings a bell, but I don't remember what that refers to. But if you're a tiny entity, then you're exempt from having to pay the fee today. And the FCC could carry that forward into this new regime after, if you assess by a service. So that's one way to reduce the burden on the smallest providers. The other thing the FCC could and should do is exempt lifeline customers from the bias fee. So that's how it does, it works right now. Under the existing system, lifeline customers do not have to pay uh, that uh, fee on their telecommunication service. The FCC could do the same. And in fact, it, it could even do that for ACP. You know, that's perhaps a different issue that we can talk about, but those are low income consumers and you could exempt low income consumers from having to pay this this fee on, on the bias service. So those are two ways that you could tailor this to reduce the impact on the smallest and low income subscribers. It's always the balance between uh, fair and complex. If it gets too complex, then it's reformed to be more fair, but when you do that, then you're invariably uh, making it more complex. Well, the challenge, uh, most challenging thing in the money world is writing tax rules because that's a, such a challenge to be fair and still get what you want to get and not be too expensive. It's really, there There are, we could probably come up with a hundred different kinds of ISPs if we put our thinking cap on and, and, the, and the law and the rules will not be that complex. So just saying, okay, great. just saying retail ISP and maybe we exempt low income was, is a pretty good, simple approach because it gets rid of all those complexities. We have to be a little yeah. careful there. We have to get a little careful because even there, there's nuances. Right now, there's there's at least nowadays probably a half a million customers served on open access networks where one guy provides the wires and other ISPs provide the service. Which one of those two do I charge? So there, there's still nuances. Uh, but as long right. as somebody pays, I don't know that we care. But um, but so well, once you, you know, say that though, Doug, then we're back to the uh, yeah you know, to which, and you you both have convinced me, though I didn't need much convincing, that uh, trying to uh, tax the content or service providers is just unworkable. Uh, though, of course, they're fat targets. I understand the attraction there. Uh, but uh, Sean McLaughlin points out that California is looking to uh, hit them up for, for funding as edge services. Uh, have no idea, Sean, how that's going to work. Uh, well, Bob, see, no, no, they're trying to they're trying to tax them just to tax them, and that that that's perfectly safe to do. It's just that to do it in a way that you could fund just the USF is where it gets complicated. So yeah, one of the challenges seems to me to be bundled services. You know, this is a TV service. It's like ninety percent of your your fee, and then ten percent is for your internet. I mean, that kind of game will certainly oh, be yeah. played as they're doing it now with the phone service, right? Right. Oh, we'll see how that uh, works. Let's see here. Uh, Don, I would like to uh, just endorse the comments that Bob Boker put in the chat. I'll just do uh, it. Yes. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you then, but a school district should not be an ISP simply because as it's when it's distributing packets to other school districts or, or even to the students. I mean, that's more akin to a, a private network. It's not selling mass market service on a retail basis to consumers. So I would not think that an IS, uh, a school system would become, would have to pay uh, as a bias provider. Um, and also thanks for, again, to Bob for digging out that note that the de minimis exception applies to anybody whose contribution would be less than $10,000. So thanks for finding that. Thanks again, Bob, our, our go-to guy on this. Mm -hmm. A lot you're of most welcome. Uh, the, uh, and you're right, John, the, the, the school networks are in effect intranets to the open internet. And so that would be whether it's, you know, in the building or around the town, it's just a closed network. Uh, that's very different, uh, than an ISP, uh, though would, would there be fees charged uh, across institutions? Would that, I don't, know, I don't want to get into that. Let's just cancel that question. I, I well, did again, note it's, that- it's a Retail service that would be assessed, not private yeah, service. Right. 
uh, uh, Doug's point about the, the uh, performance of cell systems is interesting. I think we've all kind of experienced both the increase in the, the capacity of these wireless systems and the number of holes in the in the coverage, which I agree, uh, there. I mean, I live five minutes north of the Golden Gate Bridge, and we've got holes right here in our town that, that you can't get coverage, and it's been that way, you know, from the beginning. So, is this is this five G paying off? There, the thing that we thought was an overblown hype thing, or is it actually working? Doug, it was your point. Well, so. well, what? this is the this is the government giving them money to make it work better. That's not how it's supposed to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that you know that that they're they're almost surely in twenty twenty four going to launch a nine billion dollar program to do that. So so that'll get it started at least. That and that comes out of the universal service fund. I mean, that's where that's okay. coming from. So. Well. Uh, so, Doug, are you t the, the, the FCC a few years ago did create a mobility fund within yes. the Universal Service Fund to help cell phone carriers increase their investments. To be honest, it, I haven't kept up with that. So well, I don't know. It, the status it, happened, of it. It, it never happened. Um, they were going to uh, base it upon the broadband maps and the, and the carriers all lied about their maps. So they made them start over. So that, that, this is that program finally coming to fruition. It, it mm. took them four years. Yeah. So. So it's the All same. Right, it's the same program. Yes, that would be a good so, topic for the next webinar, Don. Yes, and now they've renamed it as the five G plan instead of the mobility plan, but it's exactly the same plan. Yeah, uh, I I have a fear that the companies are the cellular companies are investing more of their money in five G networks in the urban areas, you know, sort of yes. duplicating themselves, overbuilding their own networks, but not really investing using that money to invest in the rural markets. There. I can promise you that's what they're doing. Promise you that. I agree. Completely. I mean, I, I actually, I actually look at the raw data all the time. They're not putting it out where people need it. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. No, they they advertise that in the beginning. This will give you know great service right. to everybody, but it's just not the case. That it's just classic uh, uh, pursuit of profit. So the profits are in the in the uh, dense markets where the costs are lower, providing a service, and the people have more money. So those two things, upgrading services to, to profitable parsons in the market has always been the default setting, hence universal service in the first place. The idea that we will extract funds from the pro most profitable markets and subsidize the least profitable markets so we have uh, greater equity of the, across the system. That's the, that's the underlying principle of it. And so it's a struggle because it's not, it's contrary to their basic profit motive or has been without government intervention, there would be a, it'd be a lot worse. Hopefully we can make it better. There would be no school and library fund. That would be terrible. So, yeah. Okay. We're at closing remarks time. We're going to give uh, 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 John a, a shot here at a, uh, a statement you'd like everybody to carry away with. And if there's an action item you think would be helpful at this point in time, please share that as well, John and Doug too. But John, go ahead. Well, I'll make a, a final comment, more of a political point, Don, that uh, to say the obvious that uh, 2024 is an election year. Uh, so I don't so, expect Congress or the FCC to be able to take this on and fix this in 2024. Um, but I do think there's an opportunity here over the next year. We shouldn't just do nothing. I think we, we ought to lay the groundwork for the FCC and Congress to take some action in early 2025. And it can't do so unless it has the economic rationale, the economic studies to justify the change to assess bias or, or fix the program in whatever way we can, um, develop the political support, the grassroots support, the, the advocacy support. I think we've got a year to pull ourselves together and come to consensus around a plan that we then present to the FCC in a way that's politically palatable for them to do in early 2025. And I think that should be our, that, that's the most realistic game plan. We, we can complain all we want this year, but it's not going to happen in this, in this next 12 months. But we can, I think, realistically shoot for early uh, in 2025 to get this done. Very astute, John. Thank you. Uh, Doug. Closes. I'm not. I'm not quite as pessimistic in that we have a FCC commissioner who wants to make a name for herself, the chair of person, and so it's possible she'll take it on this year. But she, but he's probably correct. 
but I also agree with him that, you know, the only way this is going to happen is for ground roots folks like you all and a whole bunch of other people to start pounding on them to say this is really important uh, because that, you know, they all love the benefits. Every every politician in Congress goes home and talks about how great it is that their schools are getting good Internet, but they don't want to help make make this work right. And so they, they need to hear about it. So uh, that's the way to really get it fixed, is to make sure that they know about it, that they, you know, uh, we, you'd be surprised how little Congress people know about issues sometimes. I think. <laughs> this is interesting. One infrastructure area where the the changes can happen visibly in a, in a, a reasonable amount of time, where a politician can actually take credit for doing things, contrary to roads and the slower stuff, which somebody else is going to get credit for. It won't happen for three or five years. But uh, hopefully they'll see that uh, it is to everyone's benefit that, that we have wider uh, uh, access to robust networks. And so thank you both for this just really useful, helpful session today. I think we have uh, aired it out pretty well. Uh, there's more, of course, to it. But I, I, I feel a consensus around this point that option A is the way to go. It's not a you know, it's not drop dead simple, but is by far the simpler of the options that are being put out there. So uh, thinking about those limitations, which Shelby has already obviously done quite a bit about, not to mention Doug. And so this is great. I want to thank you both again for just being who you are, as well as showing up today. And uh, with that, I am going to uh, thank everybody else for being here and close the recording. Now, thank you. Thank you, Don. Hit the button.